Oh, good. I thought I brought it. I hope we don't have any minutes. 31. My neck. Oh, chapter 31. Okay, we're ready to open the Littleton Planning Commission October 12th, 2009 meeting. Uh, start with roll call. Commissioner Bockenstedt. Here. Commissioner Brown. Here. Commissioner Coronado. Here. Commissioner Iteraria. Here. Commissioner Newfinke. Here. Commissioner Metcalf. Commissioner Samuelson. Here. Commissioner Stravopoulos. Here. Okay, with that, we do have a quorum. Uh, first on the agenda is the minutes for the September 14, 2009. Uh, do we have any motion? So moved. Second. Motion by Julio, seconded by Kurt. Any, anybody have any changes? I'm sorry, who seconded it? Louisville on page three is spelled wrong. voting by hand tonight um, anybody uh, any, any of the uh, yes that's seven zero I don't know I didn't think about it oh. uh, we have no general business on the agenda uh, any Unscheduled public appearances. Anyone wishing to speak about anything not on tonight's agenda? Okay, I see none. Um, we're now on to the public hearing. Uh, the, Ken the Kensington Cobblestone General PD Plan Amendment Number 1, Case Number APD09. 0003 uh, church is amending is prop is proposing to amend the PD plan to allow the installation of a monument sign um, with that let's uh, start with Jan I believe you're going to do the staff report to apologize I'm not a very good secretary and I forgot to do a public hearing roster so you could wing it without that I <laughs> I'd appreciate that but I will enter in the following exhibits exhibit a the city staff report and attachments exhibit B the application and attachments exhibit C the area reference map exhibit D the city comp plan by reference Exhibit E, the city zoning ordinance by reference. Exhibit F, the official zoning map by reference. Exhibit G, proof of posting. Exhibit H, proof of publication. And no hearing roster. So. Um, the uh, the property that we're looking at tonight is the Kensington Cobblestone um, subdivision area, which um, is outlined in this map right here. It uh, 
It's about 21 acres total, this development area here, and was annexed to the city in it's about 16 years ago in 1993. It, um, it primarily consists of single-family residential homes and, and was pretty much built out when we annexed it. Um, the uh, This parcel right here is owned by the is owned by the Jehovah Witness Church. It um, is vacant, has been zoned for church use since prior to its annexation in the city. So it was zoned that way in the county actually. Um, the uh, and so this whole area here is zoned plan development residential and is subject to the Kensington Cobblestone PD plan that the council approved in 1993 after their annexation. The uh, properties, um, most of the properties surrounding the, uh, the area is actually um, in the located now in the city of Centennial, and it's all uh, residential. Um, the uh, PD plan uh, specifies signage criteria only for the church site, and that actually restricts them to only having a wall sign uh, on their church and no monument signs. Um, they are in the process of um, going through site development plan approval process because they plan to construct their new church there. And they would like to put a monument sign in at the uh, corner of Ogden Circle and Phillips Avenue um, in lieu of a wall sign on the church. Since the signage is actually spelled out on the PD plan, it does then require an amendment of that plan in order for them to modify their signage criteria on the plan. They um, are actually proposing just the one monument sign. Uh, maximum height of letters will be six inches. The maximum sign area will be limited to 30 square feet. That would be 15 square feet on each side of the sign, each face of the sign. It will be externally illuminated. However, um, they will limit that time of illumination between the hours of 5 p.m. and 11 p.m. in order to minimize any negative impacts uh, to the surrounding residential properties. Their amendment also is proposing the allowance of temporary signs such as banners for special events that they may have and that would um, be uh, pursuant to a sign permit being issued by the city sign code. Um, they're proposing a prohibition on no signs in the windows and no permanent wall signs. Um, the, the reason they're requesting this is they'd like to have more visibility for the church identification by having a monument sign out by the street intersection and their monument sign actually is, is more compatible signage wise as the rest of the residential area because that's those are residential developments out there and they all have similar monument signs that identify their different neighborhoods. Um, I will answer a question about lighting. The uh, We're currently reviewing their, we've just finished th going through their conceptual review on their site plan and they're planning to submit fairly shortly their final site development plan review of which will include a lighting plan um, to uh, that meet, will be compliant with the uh, current city code regarding um, exterior lighting. Um, the current PD plan that they're under uh, says this about lighting. It just says parking lot lighting shall be of a type and installed in such locations that no glare is directed beyond the lot lines of tract A. It doesn't really address their exterior building lighting and that's just basically all it says. Um, the current lighting code that they have to comply under is, is actually more restrictive than that and we will get a photometric plan that actually um, shows the, the uh, light readings beyond the, the property line. And for that reason, uh, I didn't feel it was necessary for them to transfer this language over to their PD plan amendment since they really, this predated our lighting code that we have now and our current lighting code actually is more, is more restrictive and the fact that they are um, uh, placing a curfew on the illumination of their signage is even more restrictive than that because our current lighting code doesn't even require that. That was something that actually came up um, I'll get into that a little bit, under conflicts and complications. That was something that came up uh, with the review of the South Suburban Christian Church um, sign, if you recall, putting a curfew on its illumination. And um, the city of Centennial actually reviewed this pro proposal as a referral agency and, and requested that the sign be dimmed after 10 p.m. 
Um, our DRC that reviewed it also initially recommended that as well. However, the church um, did indicate that they have meetings that last till um, 10 p.m. and they needed some additional time to get people off the site and everything safely before they turn off their lights. So they did agree to a uh, uh, illumination curfew on the sign at 11 p.m. and they even indicated that they would be shutting all their exterior lighting off at 11 p.m. So um, I'd gotten that response from the planner at City of Centennial and I um, then contacted him and told him about the 11 p.m. curfew if that would be acceptable and he said it would be that that was meeting their intent of what they requested. Um, And under conclusions and recommendation, um, both the Planning Commission and City Council found that the, uh, the criteria for PD districts in the City Code were met in applying the PDR zoning to this property and approving the Kensington Cobblestone PD plan um, following its annexation in 1993. Um, the proposed amendment to allow monument sign for the church does not change the original intent of the PD plan. The proposed monument sign and signage restriction delineated on the PD plan amendment will provide more visible identification for the church and will provide signage more compatible with the surrounding residential developments, which all have monument identification signs similar in style. The lighting curfew of 11 p.m. will minimize impacts on the adjacent residential development. And So staff recommends approval of uh, the Kensington Cobblestone PD Plan Amendment Number One, and I'll be happy to ask, answer any questions you have. Um, we have folks here representing the church. Um, they, I don't believe they're really prepared to do a formal presentation. I didn't think that was really quite necessary for this project, but they would be happy to answer any questions you might have as well. Um, I have a question uh, regarding the um, the sign. The, uh, the proposal um, suggests that we allow 30, uh, 30 square foot of the sign face area, 15 square foot on each side of the sign. So there's two questions there. Um, how do we define the area of the sign face? Because if you go to the diagram that's attached here, um, there's an oval and then there's the raised letters or the engraved letters themselves. If you measure the size of the oval, it's well over 15 square feet. Uh, looks like it's about um, seven by, I, I would guess about five foot high, so it's about 35 um, square feet. Uh, well, we actually measure this, this the, the inside of this oval that has this, the actual words on it. Okay. I would suggest that's even pushing 15 Is square it? foot. And then um, why, why, would, why they would want signs on both sides of the wall. One would be facing the church, obviously. Why not put it all on one side or you know, increase the size allowance so that it allows exactly what they want to do on the corner facing the street? That on here. I, I did drive around the neighborhood and there's a lot of similar signs oh. to this around there so I don't see any reason not to do it but I, I think the way that it's written it well, may not allow well, what they're trying to a, do. You, you, you do have a good point. The sign, <laughs> they show the sign facing out the corner and then it does face inward toward the property so we'll have to ask them that question. Okay. And as far as this um, uh, Can, you know, we can have them hone that. Uh, Just check the size of, you know, would it be, yeah. if it's the inner circle, it looks like it's probably more like 20 square feet or so. I didn't measure it exactly, but. Okay. Okay, we'll double check that and make sure it gets the right size. And then I had one other question. Uh, the the um, drawing that's on the wall right now, is that from the original PD? This right here. Yes. This this actually is prepared by our mapping technician. Okay. Um, I, I'm just wondering in the in the drawing that we received that was attached to here, it shows a, a layout for the church with parking and oh, so yeah. on. Oh yeah, so they, that, they were they were just showing their um, proposed layout that they are they are doing with their site development plan just to to, to be able to demonstrate where the sign was being located. Okay. So this, yeah, this is actually taken off their conceptual site plan. So that layout was not included in the original PD. No, the PD plan actually just had a, 
vacant tract. It didn't show any layout at all. Okay. It actually looked more like that. <laughs> I can add a little bit to the discussion of signs. I had the same thought Craig did about uh, why was it 15 feet uh, on the side facing the church, but I guess I don't care if that's the way it's, it didn't make sense to me necessarily. I did take pictures of uh, two of the adjacent signs. I was curious to see when you referred in the uh, uh, documents to similar in nature, uh, let me put these two pictures and then I'll come back and describe where they are. Oh, okay. Appearance-wise, this one is almost exactly um, the design style of the one they're proposing, um, although it has the letters around the outside. This one is uh, down at the turnaround at the end of South Ogden Circle, so basically sort of to the southwest of their site. Um, and it, this and the next one that uh, Jen will help me with there, these are lit externally. Uh, in each case, you'll see a boulder there on the ground, and there's a light, a floodlight behind that that shines upwards onto that sign. and. You'll note I was not there at night, so I have no idea when the lights turn off or if they're on all night. Yeah. I... This second sign is down where our map uh, says East Phillips Avenue, and I did mark those uh, for the record as the next two exhibits, I believe. I think I've got them as uh, K, H and, H and K, I think. So, um, if anyone had any curiosity as to whether this was similar in nature to adjacent signs, yes, I found it to be so. Norm, did you uh, measure the size? I didn't. Okay. Um, if, Jan, if you, if you show that first one, we can probably get some idea. Um, I would, yeah, I would guess that uh, center oval is somewhere around five feet across. A little different arrangement with the letters. And the little thing that looks like a carriage type lamp at the top is not, it's just painted on, it's not a light. Yeah. <laughs> Any other questions for Jan? Yeah, I have a couple questions, actually, since we have that, just for clarification. Um, the area on the outside of the schematic that you've provided mm -hmm. with us outside of the, the oval, outside of the lettering, would that, is that designed to be a brick structure similar to the one that we currently have yes, on you it's, around? It's, yeah, okay. in, in it's it, yeah, to match their church, actually. So it, it's not actually just sort of holding the sign in a decorative fashion. Right, right. But, okay. right. No. The other question that I have, that that may be more for the applicants than for you, okay, but okay. you might be able to uh, answer it, is um, what if any comments have been received from neighbors concerning specifically, um, if anything, the uh, um, extension of the lighting to 11 p.m.? I've only received um, two phone calls from two neighbors, and neither one of them had anything to do with the sign. Okay. <laughs> and was there any outreach done to the neighbors? Um, yes, concerning? and I think they could address yeah, that. If, mm -hmm. uh, I would appreciate that. If, if you could actually come forward and say your name and address just for the record. <laughs> My name is Randy Krupper. I'm in the building committee for the uh, for the project, and we met uh, back in, uh, in May or June with the HOA. Uh, two or three members of the HOA, local uh, residents, uh, came to our. Uh, we had, it was kind of an open house at the uh, library, and uh, they attended there, and we showed them the drawings that we had of the uh, site plan as well as the uh, blueprints for the building. 
and uh, we talked about the sign in particular because that is what we wanted to get feedback from the HOA on and we showed uh, pictures actually we took our uh, sign model from that very picture that's up on the screen and um, and everybody that we spoke to was uh, was amenable to uh, to having the sign there now we did not discuss uh, uh, specific uh, specifically the lighting on the sign going off at uh, 11 o'clock that uh, topic was never brought up we talked uh, more about general lighting in the parking lot and um, and they were uh, they were okay with the idea of having it shut off at a particular time, although time was not mentioned. Okay, thank you. Um, do you, Jen, you, does the sign, the notice, the public notice that is there, indicate anything about the lighting? I, I'm just curious as to whether the neighbors are would be aware without looking into detail into the plan that the it just it just no I mean yeah. you've, you've got it right there okay. in your exhibit pack I think it just noticed yeah. it just it just made notification of a PD plan amendment regarding the signage let me see what it said exactly <clears throat> the uh, notice on the signs um, you know it said uh, Consider an application to amend the Kensington Cobblestone General Plan Development Plan concerning the property located at 8200 South Ogden Circle. Approval of the amendment will modify the signage criteria allowing one monument sign. So it, it didn't say anything about lighting on, on the notice. Okay. Um, I guess maybe one last uh, question for me for the applicant. Um, I understand why 10 o'clock is a little bit too early. Is 10.30? Um, still a more manageable time than 11 p.m. as a lighting curfew? 10.30 would probably be adequate. Um, we have, uh, we attend, at, currently attend a, um, a Kingdom Hall in Greenwood Village. Mm -hmm. I'm usually one of the last ones out. The lights go out at 10 o'clock and I'm always out in pitch black. Mm -hmm. so, uh, so something a little bit later than 10 o'clock we, uh, we felt was... Uh, it would be a little bit uh, more appropriate, especially with concerns for safety and so forth. Uh, 10.30 would probably be workable. Yeah, and, and because I'm trying to find maybe a specific compromise to, uh, obviously we want to make sure that it's safe for everybody to leave, um, but also minimize the impact on the neighbors, especially since the neighbors may not have been aware of the fact that that particular delay is, so we don't have any way of knowing if that's something that they're um, concerned about or not. That's all the questions for me at the moment. Other questions? I do have one question, Jan, on the um, related to the building and their lighting, the lighting code. Is there a restriction that they have to shut the lights off on that building, no. exterior building? No, they can leave our exterior current lighting lights on? code doesn't have any curfews in it. So they could leave their exterior lights on the building up as all, all night long. long if they wanted Thank to, you. yeah. Um, I would just like to mention, since Craig had pointed out possibly a little, you know, it is a little confusing because they don't really provide a specific dimension for that center of that oval. So um, we can probably work on modifying that on the plan for before, at least before the city council's public hearing. Yeah, make sure that it measures out correctly. <laughs> Thank you. One other comment too that there is a. Uh, city street light directly catty corner across the street from this that would illuminate all night long probably put out much more light than this sign would so is the applicant going to be are it's they prepared to a presentation but it just if you had uh, questions for them they're they're here can we have the applicant come down please I want to just basically ask, uh, a discussion was brought up a little bit ago about 15 feet on either side and how the actual sign was proposed, where literally only one half of the sign would be uh, open to the, if you will, to the uh, streets. Is there any reason why you're going to have both sides illuminated or have it in that configuration? 
Well, I, I think actually um, uh, the having both sides signed was uh, a bit of an artifact because originally we had discussed having the sign be perpendicular to one of the streets so that it, that it could be seen, for example, on Phillips uh, coming from either direction. Uh, we did decide then that it might be better to have it uh, on a diagonal right at the corner. Uh, and uh, so the argument that, uh, that it does little good on the reverse side uh, has validity to it. Um, uh, but by that time, the, the wheels were in motion, and so we, uh, we kind of went with both sides on the sign. I guess the question that I have for you, though, is there, did it take a vote of your HOA to come to this point where it be on the, uh, to follow the site triangle as a line rather than have it perpendicular to that site triangle? We, uh, we determined that would offer ve better visibility, our committee did. Okay. I'll, uh, I'll go with your request. Just out of curiosity, why did you put a curfew for 11 p.m. Uh, in this specific ordinance? I mean, why was that put in? Uh, I think the, uh, the background on that was... Uh, uh, the history of the uh, South Suburban Christian Church, uh, and uh, they had uh, a, a curfew um, that was, I guess, imposed on them uh, of 10 o'clock because the neighbors there had, uh, I guess, offered some complaints uh, about the lights being on all night. So, um, so that was kind of carried over to us. Uh, it didn't come from the HOA, from the neighbors, uh, but it was thought to be a, thought to be a good idea and one that we're willing to comply with. Uh, however, we felt that 10 o'clock was just a little bit early. What about its security lighting? Does this include security lighting or is that separate? Well, this uh, applies specifically to the sign uh, because the uh, flood lighting would be shining on the sign, and so it's a, there's a potential for some glare to be uh, uh, to go around the sign off into the neighborhood. Uh, the security lighting, um, the parking lot lighting, falls into this same category. Uh, we really um, don't have any specific security lighting uh, that is defined at this point. Is there any exterior lighting? to the building itself that you intend to put in that will, because my understanding from what Jen said, that can stay on all night long, correct? Yes, we have some small uh, sconce lights okay. that will be on close to, uh, to the uh, doors in the back, the fire doors, and uh, uh, those, would, uh, those would stay on. But they're very, you know, they're not floodlights or anything like that. Just out of curiosity, why did you pick 5 p.m. to limit the, to start the lighting? Oh, generally in the winter, uh, that's when we would want to turn the lights on. Uh, that's about when it's, when it's dark. Uh, that probably wouldn't have to be the case uh, in the summertime, or, or it wouldn't, uh, wouldn't really matter very much because it'd be bright anyway. Well, I'm, I'm, uh... I got the question here on the the church has the meetings until 10 and would like some additional time for everybody to clear the building and the site afterwards um, for the lighting on the sign. Is the lighting on the sign needed to exit the parking lot? Because I mean, because that's not going to light the parking lot, correct? That's just lighting the sign which is away from the parking lot. That's correct, except uh, we would, w w as we discussed, uh, the parking lot lighting would be on there as well, and they would probably be tied on the same circuit. And we would like the parking lot lighting on until, until everybody exited. Our, our meetings are generally over with at 9.15, so up to 10 o'clock is generally enough time for most people to get out, uh, but uh, sometimes we have... Uh, meetings afterwards that might go another half an hour, small meetings. Questions? 
In this document under conflicts and complications, it says the church is agreeable to shutting off the signage lighting at 11 p.m., but also shutting off the parking lot and other exterior lighting at 11 p.m. Are, is what we're dealing with today just related to the sign and not related to the, we're not, li we can't limit the exterior? Correct. The, the, the issue in front of you is the sign. And I, I just put that information in there because that's what they had commented on at the DRC meeting that they were planning to shut the parking lot lighting off at 11. Would you shut the uh, sign lights off earlier in some cases? Like if you're done with your meetings at, say, 10 o'clock? That's certainly possible, um, although, as I say, they would probably be on the same uh, circuit electrically with the parking lot lighting, and it would be on a timer, uh, so it would all go off at the same time. Uh, is it possible to have them separate? Uh, I believe it's possible. Um, I, I don't really want to commit to that without uh, my electrician here, but, uh, uh, but it's a possibility. Uh, Jan, I have a question for you. Looking at the actual PD um, amendment, because that is the document that we are recommending for approval that we're voting on. Um, it states in signage under maximum sign area. Do you know where? Have you found where we are? Uh -huh. um, the last line says 5 p.m. to 11 p.m. external illumination allowed. Um, there is no specificity to signage or building or parking lot. I would read this to mean that after 11 p.m., no external illumination is allowed, including the building. If that's not the intent of this, do we need to clarify that language a little bit more? Well, well the, you could. Uh, I mean, if you read this, this, this amendment clearly is applicable only to signage. But if you feel more comfortable modifying that language to say, um, to specify that external sign illumination allowed, or you know, to add the word sign in there to make that more, to make it more clear, you know, that's that would be fine. Or, or so you're saying that the way that it reads right now, it only applies to the sign. That, that's what the intent was. Okay. So if you if you feel like we need to probably add the word sign in there. To, to make that well then clear, no we I'm, I may want to do other I may want to add uh, external illumination sign and parking lot if eh? if that's the the agreement we've not yeah. Yeah. Uh, that that's not his amendment I mean this amendment's amendment. limited just to the sign to the sign yeah he's, so he's the bound. the parking lot then lights he the applicant will not be bound. There's right. nothing here. He may turn them on or off on his own. But he's just bound to the city sign code. Or lighting, lighting code. code. Right. And so he can turn those on and off in accordance with the city lighting code. He's just saying that it's, he believes it's all on the same electrical circuit. So that's the only reason we're having a discussion about the parking and, lot. And I will just point out, our current lighting code doesn't have a curfews at all in it for anything. <laughs> the, the proposal that you haven't seen yet, because we've been working on a redraft of it, we are actually proposing curfew on um, uses that aren't 24 hours. So, and not necessarily to turn it off completely, but to dim them down. So that's, you know. That's for the new lighting code that, that is not code, yeah. yet approved. Not yet and approved. therefore, the, this uh, plan would be grandfathered. No. Or, or would it be, or would it apply from this point on? It, it would apply once we yeah. once we adopt the lighting code. You don't grandfather in a lighting code because okay. it's not really a, okay. a use in that sense. Any other questions for the applicant? Thank you. Do we have anybody else out in the audience that would uh, like to talk to us about uh, this topic? Anybody calling in? <laughs> I haven't figured out how to do that yet. Yeah. <laughs> okay, with that I see none. Um, this time I'd like to uh, close the public hearing. 
I move that the public hearing be closed. So move. Is that a second? <laughs> I'll make a second on Julio. Seconded by Julio. All in favor? Once again, 7 0. Um, open the discussion. Uh, you want to go ahead and start, oh. Norm? Well, let me make a motion. Oh, yeah. yeah, let me make a motion here that uh, uh, Planning Commission resolution number 09 07 be approved and we forward uh, a favorable recommendation to City Council. I'll second that. Motion by Norm, seconded by Pavlos. And then as far as discussion, uh, I think they've uh, done a good job of uh, trying to fit into the neighborhood. Um, when I saw in the documents that the, the sign was uh, similar in nature, I went out to look. It's almost exactly the same. and. Um, I guess the lighting of it doesn't concern me particularly um, when viewed uh, relative to the parking lot lighting and the things that we don't have that aren't part of this. Uh, the first sentence of the amendment purpose says uh, to amend the signage provisions. So we're just dealing with the signs. And uh, I think this looks good. These are nice looking signs. I uh, really don't have anything. I think the um, street light across the street, Caddy Corner, is going to put out more light than this will, and I, it's very comparable to the other signs, as Norm says. So, I would like to make a uh, friendly amendment to the motion, only because of the fact that there's a couple of things I want to put in here. One is uh, more in the realm of findings of fact along your same motion, just to kind of give it a little bit more... Uh, fat to the bones, so to speak. Bear, hearing me out, uh, the first thing I'd like to say is that favorable recommendation to the City Council with the exhibits, that'd be number one. Two, from the standing of findings of fact, I'd like to add that the sign criteria stated in the PD pertains only to the church site. Oh, let's get it backwards, but anyway. And that uh, under intent, under the city uh, rules of 10-223A, where it says the PD district is hereby created to promote the health, safety, and general welfare of allowing more flexible development based upon a comprehensive uh, integrated plan. I'd also like to add the what is it, six items that are under 10 223B. So we have all that covered because that's the in, under that they talk about the application and intent of the city council. Also, um, I'd like to add that the church is agreeable to only shutting the signage, signing, signage lighting at 11 p.m. I want to make sure that's clear and that my last uh, finding the fact is that the proposed amendment to allow a monument sign for the church does not change the original intent of the PD thank you Do we need a second? I'll second that. Motion by Julio, seconded by Pavlos. I, I have a question, Julio, on um, the amendment the, on the on your um, motion to amend. Um, and I'm trying to think which one. Um, he had was it got a little confused. What's the 
Could you tell me a little bit more of your intent? What are you? My intent is quite simply just to put in some findings of fact so that when this goes up to the city council, they have a clear understanding of why we're approving it and the direction to them of uh, the, its boundaries. So that there is an intent, there's a consistent intent mm -hmm. to the plan development, dealing with the signage, this new signage criteria as well, okay. and pretty much establishing that for our decision making. All right, yeah. Then my other question is moot then. I'm still having a problem with the uh, lighting curfew time, um, you know, partially because in our in the South Suburban Christian Church, we agreed from six in the morning to ten at night, and I hear your point, um, Kurt, that the sign, the street sign, is pretty bright. Um, you know, in the ordinance, we have just an end time; we don't have a start time either. So, you know, I have no problem with eleven o'clock. It just is there some kind of consistency that we want to have for some of these um, sessions? Right. Just to answer mm -hmm. your question, the one that we, the other church that we had was more of a digital uh, sign versus this one is just an external sign. This is not a moving sign. It's not anything. It's very stagnant. What you see is what you get. It's pretty much like signing, like a lighting a uh, a painting, if you will, versus something that's. Uh, message oriented that can change etc so i thought that that was a, that's a major difference in my mind could i also make a point of order that just to keep things clear that we limit the discussion right now to julio's amendment vote on that and then go back to the discussion on the on the general issues the otherwise we'll, we'll the get 11 o'clock is in on, yeah, is, on. is yeah, okay. on his yeah yeah that he, that's as if as a Finding of fact, not necessarily recommending, but so I'll call the question on Julio's motion. Okay. Okay. The question has been called. Um, Julio's amendment is to. Maybe I should do it because I. My <laughs> comment is it's real simple. I, I gave out and I can give you my notes, Thank you. which are all Thank highlighted you. anyway, <laughs> so that you. But the comment is basically there's a number of statements that are right out of the staff report that deals with the findings of fact. There's nothing new that I added to this particular uh, uh, findings in, in, in retrospect, if you will. It's all right before you. It's exactly the same information that you've been given thus far. I just... And I'll just point out that your resolution, the draft resolution you have in front of you, has a, a findings... Similar. statement in there which is similar to Julio's so just just for your information it's, it's section one in your resolution uh, yeah a fundamental yeah. distinction is um, that the uh, exhibits that the uh, norm brought forward are added to that and I think that's important um, to the question so. we need to vote oh. okay mm -hmm. um, everybody in favor five uh, against that would be two uh, in favor would uh, actually those of those opposed would be uh, Kurt and Norm passed five to two uh, back on to the discussion for the original. Linda. Do you guys think that we actually need to have a lighting curfew in the ordinance itself? I mean, can we just leave it so that it, can we exclude it? That'll give the applicant a little bit of flexibility to adjust the times. <laughs> I, um, hmm. For, for the sign, can I ask a question for the sign mm -hmm. or for the parking lot? The sign. The sign. If you wanted to the do that, you could light. introduce that as an amendment. Yeah. The, the, only, the only comment I might have is that 
the city and Centennial requested that and <laughs> and DRC had recommended it and I had informed that planning staff person that the 11 p.m. curfew is agreeable to the church I I just you know An um, amendment or do you I, want I don't uh, just kind of would like to hear people's under the opinion. resolution here under section one the last sentence says lighting curfew of 11 p.m. will minimize impacts on adjacent residential development um, I my motion was to adopt this resolution which includes this section one and the whereas is and so on I it seems to me that it's, it's all right there in the resolution we're adopting and we're recommending uh, to council be adopted between that and the um, amendment to the PD that's spelled out here on the sheet, I thought that covered everything. The applicant was agreeable to it, and yeah. it's an agreement with a the, verbal the agreement with Centennial. Eleven so o'clock is right, stay with that. right there. If you guys wanted to amend it to change that time, I think that would be appropriate. But I don't think it needs to anything else, considering that last sentence. Yeah, and I would say that. Considering this is something that's specifically requested by referral agencies and by staff and that the applicant is agreeable to to grant the applicant more flexibility than they have asked for um, when it may increase the impact to neighbors who haven't necessarily been made aware of that this is going to be one of the changes that will happen there. Um, I, you know, I, I don't think that's necessarily a good way to go. Um, again, that's not even a request from the applicant. Uh, so, if you're asking for a straw poll, <laughs> <laughs> what I am, <laughs> Greg. Well, I, I generally have no problem with the application. There are just a couple um, small elements in, in the terms of unintended consequences. One was the size of the sign that um, I'm concerned with, and. Um, perhaps it's you know limiting the sign space to a total of 30 square feet on both sides and saying it won't exceed 20 square feet on any one side or something like that. Um, if indeed the applicant feels that it's okay the way it is, I'm fine leaving it the way it is. Um, also, um, the uh, showing the site plan on the PD does that open any. Um, changes to the normal site development plan approval process um, since the original PD did not show the plan with parking and building I, I would just be well, the, well, the purpose that. of that being on the PD plan amendment was just to be mainly illustrate where the sign would be located in relation to the rest of the okay. property okay again I have no problem just wondering if there's any unintended consequences there in the site development review process um, and I just noted the uh, word site triangle is, is spelled S I T E. Yeah, people do <laughs> I that, see that all the all time. The time. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, otherwise, I'm, I'm fine with the proposal. I'm also okay with the proposal. I, I won't make that as an amendment, I will simply make that as a request to staff that clarification as to the parking lot. Uh, light in the curfew um. is made a little clearer I think when I read the report not being familiar with all the things about the lighting ordinance and not being fully aware of some of the forthcoming changes it was a little confusing is it all. confusing in the staff report as well as on the PD plan amendment not the PD plan is fine okay it, it's, it's the staff report that left me a little confusing because effectively we're putting forward that the applicant is agreeing to something okay. that they're really not agreeing. I'm, I'm not saying that you're not being honest about it. The applicant, I'm just saying that that's an agreement that is not part of the process and part of the application. And I think if the, in the, the report and in the presentation to uh, City Council, that's just clarified a little bit. I think what that. I might do is just leave half that sentence off. I, 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 that, that would be my, my recommendation of just not even bringing that up altogether um, since it's not something that is either part of the application or something that the city can um, enforce or require. Uh, it, it might 
help from diluted I, I appreciate that. Yeah. Comment. Other than that, um, and again, I'm, I, I think that the inclusion of the um, photo, uh, particularly the one that is currently um, on the wall that norm providers an additional exhibit would be helpful. Yeah. And I'm also okay with the plan, and I like the way the applicant has um, kind of blended the sign into the overall character of the neighborhood. So. I also, I am okay with it. Um, with that, we're ready to vote on the original amendment on sending forward a uh, favorable recommendation to council for the resolution uh, what 0907 as amended as amended all in favor opposed seven zero in favor Thank you very much. Uh, that being done, we are now move on to the long range planning, uh, which I'll turn over to Dennis. Uh, just real briefly, we're going to go into a study session after the regular meeting, so we'll, we'll have more long range planning at that point. Okay, okay so, so we're not doing the reports and in this portion we could do it either way if you prefer to do them here we can do them here or we can do them after after the meeting in the study session uh, excuse me we did them last time in the meeting that's fine if you want to do that again that's right. whichever you prefer so do you want i think if we that? do the reports now and okay. then we adjourn the public um meeting and move on to the study okay. session Great. would be cleanest excellent uh norm did you want to be first in terms of giving your I'm report <laughs> Just starting to dig for the uh, information uh, basically maybe I'll just give a brief synopsis the um, facade and uh, maintenance grants were uh, under con requests uh, were under consideration at the Historic Preservation Board they had requests uh, that totaled more than they had to allocate uh, several of the people making the requests were there um, there were a couple that they uh, took out of the mix, uh, deferred probably until next year, but um, they are awarding uh, monies for uh, painting, for uh, carpentry work, uh, various aspects at various properties. I'll refer you to the minutes of their meeting if you want to see the details of each and every proposal. Um, they also had two COAs, um, one for changes, um, basically window replacement to the second story where the uh, sugar rush is um, on Main Street between Main and Alamo. Um, what's the cross street? Is that Nevada? Um, anyway, the second floor of the sugar rush which opened the candy store. Um, and the other one is to the uh, where the uh, Centennial Vacuum used to be. They are going to do uh, a phased um, remodeling. Um, they're going to add a very small piece of connecting uh, enclosed area, an outdoor seating area. Uh, with some lighting they are going to attempt to well, they're going to uh, replicate the original look as much as possible although there was a discussion the historic looking fixtures don't meet the lighting code so there's some conflict there um, <clears throat> again I'll just refer you to the documents uh, they're available in the minutes of the meeting This is a point of discussion. Um, since we're updating the comp plan, and that seems to be, you know, a big issue, it might be worth our while when we're doing and looking around and everything else. I think one of the things we have gotten about 
is the fact that there's a need for just that, where if you're going to try to create a historical area, the, the lighting that might be of that era will never be of the same standard as we currently have it. We've actually had discussion with the lighting ordinance that we would want to exclude um, historic districts and possibly even downtown. Um, it, it, it's so unique it in seems terms of reasonable yeah. that that would be something we would take under consideration before mm -hmm. we uh, completed our, our comp plan of this area. Okay. Uh, and it seems like you know that could be one of many issues that has not quote surfaced yet, but is surfacing in its own little interesting way. It was the first time it uh, came up as since I've been uh, liaison. I think if you go back to our language, I think we included, although it's been a while, uh, in the draft, in harmony with, and, um, you know, whatever lighting exists of a historic nature that's managed to survive uh, any new uh, restoration to be in harmony with is probably going to be vintage looking and not in compliance. So you've got offsetting principles, but uh, if you are, you know, if you get that into the comp plan, you have something to lean on there. I guess, you know, I, I would like to go beyond the term harmony and try to be a little bit more specific so that it's a clear direction for anybody who's coming in and which even imposes upon us you know, where is that district, if you will, and even though it is, um, I think everybody has their own thoughts of where that might be, we need to kind of nail it down. Yeah. There are a couple issues we've been looking at with the, the draft lighting ordinance. One is that in, down, in the downtown itself, the current lighting ordinance is very difficult to enforce because of the size of the lots. The lots are very small. The buildings come up to the property lines. There's, it's very difficult to have lighting that does not go onto your neighbor's property, go into the public right away, go somewhere it's not supposed to go typically with the lighting ordinance. And so we've looked at that as an exception. It really doesn't work downtown, so how do we adjust for that? The other one is the historic lighting, is that historic lighting did not have the same limitations on it. And so we've looked at providing some more flexibility for that as well, but I think it's a great discussion point for us. So um, we're currently looking at bringing the lighting ordinance to DRC um, at the next DRC meeting, which I believe is the 22nd, um, and then we'll bring it to Planning Commission shortly thereafter and, and to City Council. So we're looking at trying to get that moving fairly quickly. Is there a possibility that you could get that lighting ordinance to the historical uh, preservation group before we saw it? Yeah, we're looking at, at doing an internal review before, so we're looking at staff as, as, uh, as a review and, and boards which would be uh, interested in. So I think that's a great idea to take it to HPB. So, yeah. Because, you know, if that's the intent of where we want to go and how we want to maintain things, I think we need to be sensitive to that. Not sure what you mean. I, I thought I'd go ahead and pass these down. The first two are the COAs. And uh, just so you guys have some things to look at, you'll be familiar with which building it is. If you want to take all this home and read through it all, be my guest. Um, the next, I think there's five, are the requests for facade work and uh, maintenance. There was one dropped um, down here, uh, Vanguard Building. Uh, Bussard and Vanguard buildings, 2670 and 2680 West Main, down near the, at the end near the melting pot, across from uh, Bradford Auto Body, more or less. And there's pictures on all of these uh, estimates and so on. So if you just want to glance at those, that'll distract the entire planning commission for the next five minutes. <laughs> if you want to look at them later, you know, Kurt, did you have any reports? No. Leo? None. Nothing. Pavlos? Um, yeah, I think for the, and Dennis, maybe you can help me out on this. Um, I got asked by three different people, one the next morning, um, in various degrees of what the heck was that report um, when they were from the last minute with um, uh, Nick Farley's presentation of kind of redoing downtown or that mentioned. So I, 
it, it would appear to me that we did not make the intent of that entirely clear. So since I wasn't actually present in the discussions that came in, Dennis, if you can maybe again for the record and for anybody that listens clarify um, that, that would be Absolutely. useful. <laughs> yeah, we, we tried a, a couple times, but I, I think it, we were a little afraid it was going to be a little bit be, be like Orson Welles. And, you know, so. um, <laughs> but, <laughs> and it may have been. Um, this is not a proposal. This is not reality. This is strictly you know, total fantasy in terms of looking at existing zoning. What is potential build out uh, given the parking requirements, given the, the massing requirements, given the setbacks, the open space requirements, the height requirements, and kind of uses that you might be able to use it. So just it's, it's an exercise really in terms of what's possible with existing CA zoning, existing B2 and R5 zone districts. And that was the intent is to just look at what is the massing potential given that zoning. And there are lots of different parameters can go into that. Uh, we we kind of chose some that seemed more consistent with the kind of proposals we've had, the kind of approvals we have from City Council. Um, and so we, we looked at just a, a random selection of sites really downtown that has some development potential. So again, it, it's not anything for downtown, it's not what we're proposing. It really was just an exercise in terms of here's what the existing zoning allows. Is this what you know, we, we think is appropriate? So it's really kind of background as we get into further discussion on the zoning. Thanks. And, and again, I want to emphasize for anybody who might be um, listening in on this that yes, all the um, owners of the properties had been consulted ahead of time. We didn't uh, pull that on anybody. Um, and again, the idea is to really say if we did nothing, what are some of the possibilities that could um, be approved right now without it coming in front of us? Um, as a way of saying, is that um, too much and we want to scale it down? Is it just right and we want to leave it as it is? It's not enough and we want out? Or, or how could it play out? Um, but not that that is an actual proposal that we'll see, nor that those are necessarily the most realistic scenarios. But I think when we do things like that, sometimes people get a little jumpy. So. Yeah, I heard similar comments too. Okay, great. Thank you. Okay. Um, yeah, I just wanted to say uh, I attended uh, the Colorado APA along with with Kurt and Dennis and Jan were there, and um, I, uh, just uh, bringing back some of the main topics that were covered. That's the APA is the uh, Colorado uh, American Planning Association uh, two day conference annual conference. Um, the main topics were um, that I heard um, had to do with sustainability implementation of green initiatives within uh, various jurisdictions within the city. It's a big trend. Um, accommodating alternative energy similar to what we did with the uh, the wind generation uh, ordinance. Um, uh, the uh, uh, trend toward mixed use and more compact development in, in downtown areas, uh, transportation, uh, connectivity, TOD um, issues are, are big in, in many of the municipalities and um, heard a lot about making making do with less in terms of uh, bud budgets based on sales tax revenue and um, so um, very, some very good sessions well attended and uh, well worth the time. Were there any specific handouts that you received or that you felt would be useful? Uh, I believe they're available, but I have not downloaded anything off their website. Yeah, almost yet. everything was online at this point, so we need to go back and get the most of the, what they seem to have was the PowerPoints from the presentations themselves, right. some of which were complete, some were rather incomplete because they had the, the, the whole discussion going on at the meeting. So. Could you forward a link to that? Um, mm -hmm. To all of us, I think. I, I don't know if there's a single link to it. I think they're individual links, but bending. But even sort of a, as a kind of the central site, and this is, you know, sure. go further and you'll find them here and there. That would be. Um, uh, I'll have to check and make sure that's true because it looked like they were, you were having to go to the individual consultant who, or a person who did the site, did the presentation itself from, from, the, from what the, the, uh, yeah, the, the information that we got at the meetings indicated. So, but I'll check and see if there is one at the Colorado okay. APA site. I was, or told, if there's I was told they were not going to put them on the one site. Oh, really? That they're all, all individual? That's what they said yeah. in the last What we could do is get, I can get you a copy of uh, the programs um, and send that out to you because that has all the individual. Yeah, electronic, on. you know, electronic would be great. great. So okay. for and see if I, I, sorry, I passed through my... Oh, no. Yeah, did you have uh, any report? I did. Um, I want to talk a little bit about the APA conference as well, uh, and, and Kurt might as well. But 
Um, we'll talk, there's a study session tonight City Council has on the proposed police addition. This is uh, part of City Council's ongoing kind of phased uh, look at the feasibility and the cost and, and what is possible with, with the expansion of, of the police building at this site uh, going to the north and east of our current building. That might be of interest to you just to come and get some background or watch it on Channel 8, I think, uh, just because uh, it's really interesting in terms of what is being proposed and what the discussion is, and uh, I think you'd find it of interest. Um, secondary, the next meeting we have, we do not have a, a public hearing, so we can do it all as a study session, which I think would be great. Uh, I've been working on updating the, the draft plan that we have. I will send that out to you with revisions to it based on comments I've heard, and I'm sure I've missed some along the way, and, and, but it's just as a point of discussion so that we can actually move forward fairly quickly, hopefully getting a draft to, to City Council. Uh, I think if we have something in hand, it's much easier to go through and, and actually you know, edit and, and see where we want to be with that. Um, then with the APA conference, a couple of interesting things, um, one of which we had a discussion, you know, what is mandated by, by state statute? And, and the only thing we came up with, I think, was tourism, some kind of statement about tourism. Well, there seems to be a second one, too, and people had a, a devil of a time finding what the second one was, but it's shooting ranges. Uh, we have to have some language in the comp plan about shooting ranges. Uh, okay. Um, I don't know what we're going to say about town, but we'll, we'll have to say something, I guess. <laughs> um, the other thing that was interesting to me was APA has a, has a fairly effective and, and long-term lobbying effort at um, the, the state legislature. And one of the things that I thought might be of interest, one thing that they were thinking of as well, is when we look at our light rail stations, um, there's some real limitations if there were every interest on part of the city and planning commission city council to look at development of those sites for something other than surface parking lots, RTD is really hemmed in in terms of what they can do with the state legislation. It might be something that, that would be of interest to the APA uh, uh, legislative liaisons, I think, uh, to try and look at how do we you know, change those. Um, for, for one, you know, they can't compete with surrounding communities, so that means they basically can't put in anything that's in the surrounding community. They can't put in a retail that com competes, can't put anything else onto those sites. Um, they can't do residential on that site, even though residential and office are probably the two uses that really makes, seem to be most successful at, at, at transit-oriented development sites. Um, they can't generate non-transit trips, so it means that any traffic they get to their stores or anything else has to use just transit seemingly, which it makes it almost impossible because people are going to drive, and if you want successful retail at all, you've got to have other, other access. Um, and RTD can't take the lead in any development projects. They have to be, you know, kind of step back. And so uh, there's some real limitations, I think, in terms of you know, what actually can happen. Um, and then there's a board policy as well that just says that they have to replace the parking one for one. And that really becomes quite difficult in a lot of situations uh, and seems counter to the goal of having you know, transit, which actually allows people to, to use alternative tr transportation, to say you have to have that many parking spaces instead of encouraging you know, them to, to take bus or walk or whatever they might do. So all those things are things we might think about. Um, oh, the other thing, just being is, real is, clear. Excuse so, yeah. me. When you're talking about the TODs, mm -hmm. I know that there's a... Uh, Dr. Cog has been working really hard on that as well. Mm -hmm. Have they made that linkage to the state resolutions or RTD? I don't rules? know if they have or to the APA uh, efforts. You know, I think that would be interesting to kind mm -hmm. of Connect create those. That can make that connection because yeah, I would think so too. From what I can see, you got Dr. Cog going off in one direction and pumping up t TODs, but right. if, if there's a reality to this whole thing that pretty much squashes it, right? and I think there's a big issue that needs to be confronted. I would think so, too. So, But then specifically uh -huh. on that, my understanding is that those are limitations that apply to what RTD can do on RTD-owned property. Correct. And that the point of that is so that, so that RTD does not become a development agency as opposed to a transportation agency. It's, it's, it's not to say that right. those can't happen, uh -huh. but that RTD should not become enter into competition with what municipalities or private developers. Right. And I think um, that's true. And I think it's something we need to discuss because the dilemma for us is the way RTD acquires its property, they put their parking adjacent to their, their light rail site. So the best site that we have in terms of connectivity from the light rail station to downtown is owned by RTD. It's their surface parking lot right at the station. 
And so I think that's a trade-off we have to think about and, and where the city falls on that. Yeah, because it definitely is a trade-off, you're right. So, uh, but that you're absolutely right, it's RTD-owned property only. It's, it's yeah, and, and, and I think it's just important is just to set right. the limitations. Now, absolutely. what could happen is if, if Other things there was a trade-off and right. city acquired the area that is currently the parking lot and the parking lot was situated a bit further away that was owned by RTD, then that's one way of maybe settling that. Right, and I... My understanding is, I think, given at least board policy, that they may have restrictions where they actually couldn't sell it to the city, you know, that type of thing. So, um, the other thing that came real clear, I think, looking at other light rail stations, is that Lilton, as we know, is extremely fortunate. And, and one thing is that we've got a 360 degree light rail stop, I would say, downtown, where it really has 360 degrees of access and, and good um, connection to, to the light rail station. A lot of people. Uh, have those 180 degree stations where it really is so cut off by train or or something um, that they just don't have the connection. We're fortunate that our our train is there, but it's depressed and you have bridges over it, and it really is connected very well. So I think you know, it's something we need to really be aware of. I think you know how unique our our station really is, and when you look at uh, the, the the stations on I-25, for example, you know they've got. 10 lanes of I-25 between them and anything on the other side. So just trying to get across those as pedestrian, trying to get them across those comfortably is, is really quite the nightmare compared to what we've got. So, um, Let me think here. And I think the rest of it was just notes for me, but yeah, but again, I think it's, oh, um, oh, the other thing that kind of came up was that the last session was on the economy, and it, it's something, again, that I think we need to think about, every city in the state needs to think about, because we're so focused on revenue from, from our retail base, our sales tax base, is that as the economy shifts from, from retail to service-based, as, you know, as the population ages, that's a real challenge for us that we need to be thinking about. So it's in the back of our heads. It's not necessarily a downtown comp plan thing, but it certainly is something we need to be you know, thinking about at some point, too. So yeah. and that's, I think, all I had from, from APA. So. Okay. Kurt, did you have anything you heard? Um, I was going to type up my notes and distribute to everyone so that we can have those for the next meeting. But the, it was a very interesting meeting. What I found interesting, there are a lot of um, independent uh, planners out there uh, attending these conferences. One of the things I found interesting was the um, uh, presentation by the C City of Boulder in Denver about inclusionary units, meaning that when they've got a developer that's developing more than 30 uh, residential units, they also must include homes for um, moderate income people, so they have to price those down so that they, uh, a, a certain percentage of those units I think it's 10 percent, 5 to 10 percent of them have to be inclusionary for moderate income households. And uh, it was very interesting in the way they can buy out of that, which uh, as far as the Denver's program, they let them buy out of it, and it doesn't cover the cost of purchasing new units for those people. So they're, they're looking at changing that program. But very interesting all the way around, and I'll get my notes out to everybody. Anybody ready for adjournment? I so move. Second. Moved by Norm, seconded by Pavlos. Uh, or Jeremy. Ready? Aye. All right. Unanimous. Woohoo. Okay. Uh, did we want to continue on it's, uh, with presentations on, on the downtowns that you visited? I've got Norm slides in. in um, in my computer, so we can I, I brought in a few pictures. I do have some from downtown Pueblo, uh, a historic district. They've done things similar to what we have and uh, have benches, trees. They have this huge anchor of Union Station, which they've preserved. Um, it's got residential units, none available. Uh, I would like to uh, see what those look like. I, I have a feeling they're fairly nice. Um, downtown Abilene, I'll describe these if you like as we go, uh, leaving one that Dennis I think can describe to you. Uh, this is downtown Abilene, uh, Kansas. A lot of, uh, Abilene is doing well compared to some of the other small town, um, small town downtown districts. It doesn't have 
too many vacancies. Of course, the Eisenhower uh, Museum is near and quite a tourist attraction. There's uh, another picture. This is taken from their uh, Union Pacific Depot, which much as our depots are repurposed. That is uh, not <laughs> Kansas. There we go. That uh, this is to the right side is the uh, facade of the Union Pacific Depot facing the uh, town. Yes. Oh, I'm, I'm sorry, I got to interrupt you, but on that first sure. slide, it looked like there was a streetcar there. No, the one one before this one. I think. Uh, uh, there's a bus. I the think. The right. Yeah, is that I, a bus? Th there's a bus that looks like a streetcar, but it's okay. they don't actually have. Um, Light rail. <laughs> They'll have cattle drives through there. Uh, I did not see any, but they certainly have uh, on the other side of the. Uh, let's see, Dennis, I, I've lost track. Go back one, maybe, if you would. Oh, go. No, nope. we had it there. Okay. Um, on this one, this is the uh, town side of that uh, depot, and on the other side, they have heavy rail about six tracks and grain elevators that are still being served. So you talk about your 180 degree, um, there's railroad crossings at grade for the streets. Um, that actually is my father there walking away from me and walking the dog. Uh, there's the facade, sort of an art deco. Uh, nice to see the old buildings uh, preserved. I suspect it's been expensive to preserve that. It's their tour tourism bureau there, and then also a large meeting room. Uh, looked like it was for rent. Still all in Abilene. One of their larger mansions. This one has sold, apparently. Uh, Liebold Mansion, I believe, is the name of it. And so we didn't get to go in. But uh, we don't have anything quite of that scale. There's the other side of the depot. <laughs> In the distance, you can see the uh, green elevators, and you can see the um, heavy rail traffic right there at grade. Um, you know, sound-wise, and uh, a lot of aspects there. Uh, you know, <laughs> you wouldn't have a birthday party for uh, six-year-olds probably at the downtown depot. <laughs> uh, they'd be all over. Dennis will explain this one to you. This is a, a small little town called Madison. Population, what do you think, Norm? Maybe a thousand? Um, fewer? Eight hundred? Yeah, I don't know. We we didn't uh, actually go through the downtown there. Ah, it's very Our small. Dad has a friend that he knew there, and we stopped. And as Dennis and I spoke, turned out Dennis was familiar with Madison. Yeah, my great grandparents uh, used to slide down the hill from uh, Standpipe Hill, which is a very steep hill for Kansas. So there weren't very many, but this is one of them. So, so I threw that one in there. <laughs> Took a, my dad's friend lived right next house over. Uh, this is at the Eisenhower Museum. Um, their brick uh, implores you don't spit on the sidewalk. <laughs> and then they'd sold those. Here's one of the uh, historic buildings, and I don't know. This is not Madison. I don't remember which town, but boarded up. Um, I think there's some other views of it. They still have their buildings, as you can see around it. The facades have suffered. They could be restored, but there's no business in those little Kansas towns. There's one that's uh, a little bit better preserved. That was, uh, yeah, there's another one. They've got some nice, nice older buildings. Uh, but again, we're very fortunate here in Littleton. We have uh, the light rail. We have people, some people do get off Santa Fe. And even though traffic can be difficult from Littleton Boulevard, we have people that come through our downtown Nowadays, people get on I-70 and bypass these smaller towns yeah, that much thing, too much. The thing that really stands out, I think, too, is how wide some of these streets are. Normally. <coughs> they are. Amazingly wide. Yeah. There's not a lot of streetscaping going on. There's not many trees. There aren't, aren't many pedestrian amenities you know, here. They uh, haven't had the money, I don't yeah. think. The diagonal parking is nice, I think. Uh, yeah. <laughs> There's plenty of parking. Yeah. They do yeah. not have a parking problem. <laughs> uh, just some more of the facades. Not a lot of people on the sidewalk either. No. These are weekdays, pictures from weekdays. It, uh, you know, there's some, there's people. Uh, this is downtown Pueblo. This is uh, historic Union Avenue. 
And it's, uh, oh, in the last five years, it, the, the, the uh, vacancy rate probably hasn't changed a lot. They've redone it with uh, streetscaping. Um, is this an historic plaque here, Norm? Yep, yeah, it is. That describes that building. Actually, when I first pulled up, um, there were some people, uh, three or four people, I guess it was two couples maybe, uh, standing there reading it. And uh, when I started taking pictures, they scurried away. <laughs> I was bad for retail. <laughs> yeah, Pueblo's been really active, I think, with her downtown, certainly the riverfront. They've, you know, they've really tried to support for, for that. For many years they've been working on it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. The pay parking on there? Um, no, I don't believe it. Is. I, well, there, there is public free parking. There, I think, yeah, it looks like there's meters. Uh, around the corner from here, it's free. And then further down the street, closer to Union Station, there's uh, a public lot. That's one building that survived. Uh, that's, again, catty corner from the old Union Station downtown. That one was empty. That's Union Station in the distance, and again, you can see the lighting, the streetscapes, and so on. And uh, that parking um, between the Union Station and us, where you see the cars, that's all free parking there. And where's the river from here, Norm? Uh, it's on the other side of the station. Back here. And in 1921, it was 13 feet up the station. There's many, many dramatic pictures of... They went through and then channelized the river for... They channeled the Arkansas right they've, River. They've taken out some of the channelization yeah. and something more natural, I think. So. Well, um, it, it, the real channel is actually still... Uh, there's a, oh, probably a dozen tracks. We're at the northeast corner of the station, basically. So to the south, to our left there, there's still quite a few tracks there, and some are in use, heavy rail. And then there's a big, huge berm, and the uh, Arkansas River flows on that far side of that berm. Uh, they have diverted some for uh, the river front project down there where they have uh, the little the little boats and park area and so on. It's it's very nicely done, but it's not the real river. And the real river caused an awful lot of trouble over the years. <laughs> Still more of Union uh, uh, Union Avenue showing the streetscaping benches and plantings and trees and lighting. Interesting to know how they maintain this. If this is. I'm assuming this is not a business improvement district, but it might be. I don't know. Or if the city does it or how they um, actually finance the, the maintenance. I, I think it might be a district. I'm not sure. It's back to Abilene. Not all the way through. I think. More Abilene. <laughs> and back to Littleton. Um, or other things you want to say about that? Or? Um, no, I think I've covered it. We're, downtown Littleton is pretty good. The city supports, um, oh, through the repaving the street, got that done. The crosswalk is a little more distinctive. Um, you know, benches, the flowers, all of that, all those elements that in some of those smaller Kansas towns are missing because they don't have the revenue. Um, we've got that. And um, people have been redeveloping properties in downtown Littleton. Uh, the facades look good. The documents I sent around, the city is supporting um, maintenance and restoration of those. Uh, so it, it's almost a case of look how, look at all the things we're doing right um, and our ability to do it, of course, all that. Uh, infrastructure and maintaining that brings businesses down there and that maintains the revenue level and then the city can afford to do those things it's uh, uh, it's a circle that is uh, if it if there's a weak link and it starts to unravel then of course you end up with the uh, uh, deterioration and in, in boarded up storefronts so we've uh, I think I'll go back to Kent Bagley who said we have a brand and we have light rail and so many towns would just kill for those things. 
Um, no, no, Norm, I have a question. In, in your travel, especially in Pueblo, did you see any um, rela relationship between the main street commercial areas and the adjacent residential neighborhoods or any infilling that's starting to occur based on the success of the riverfront project? Or? Not in Pueblo. Uh, that's really the historic downtown part the suburbs, if you will, and the, most of the residential is on the other side of the Arkansas River. Um, there's uh, repurposed uh, in Union Station, the third floor has some residential stuff. There's no vacancies there. The second floor of a lot of those buildings is, uh, well, it, I guess in years past and in some of the newer developments here, we've got residential on the second floor and those buildings are um, relatively unimproved residential on the second floor walk-up flats you know they haven't gone condo or anything like that haven't been um, oh was it golden i think that had the um, additions built with additional residential that got them the egress they needed and uh, elevators and things like that by adding on sort of behind a historic structure that has not gone on in Pueblo. It's mostly a business district. Anybody else have uh, areas they've, they've toured they want to talk about? I know we've heard from almost everybody so far. So, Well, I think there's been some discussion on a um, variety of different areas but one of the things that I want to point out because um, I frequent uh, a fair amount the South Pearl area I've got friends who have several of the stores there um, and others and one of the things that strikes me is that it's really busy um, it has a fairly active nightlife it's actually almost impossible to get uh, parking down there um, in the evening, it has a very active enforcement of parking uh, most of the time. It's, it's free parking, but it's two-hour limited um, for the most part, up from 8 to 6 p.m. And while they do have a light rail, um, I haven't noticed, and in my discussions with at least three different owners there, they haven't noticed any specific advantage to having the light rail there. It's further away. Um, it's completely disconnected. There is no uh, notion of what will go on. There is no park and ride um, there. There is some TOD development that is happening around the area of the light rail station, but it doesn't seem to uh, have affected uh, things um, that much. And it just reinforces idea of when I've talked to people and say, well, what about a parking problem? And they say, yeah, isn't it nice? I mean, I'm paraphrasing, but their perspective is we have more people coming to visit than we can handle. That's a good problem to have. Um, and also uh, a very active art scene, um, very active destination area, uh, very active nightlife, very active um, weekend activity, and the farmer's market that's there on Sundays, uh, as well as the uh, monthly art walk that they have, attract a lot of people to the area who then familiarize themselves with the, the different stores there are and continue to come back. Um, the fact that it's close to the university does attract a little bit of, uh, of attention, mostly at the coffee shops, late night studying and, and stuff like that. Things get a little busy during midterms and final period at DU. Um, but if I look at what we tend um, to lack at downtown, and not to downplay the, the idea of we have a lot of good things um, there, um, definitely the fact that there's an active night and, uh, and weekend life, that this is an area that operates all the time, um, and that the stores stay open and they attract a lot of attention. I think is important, and I think that the farmer's market and the art walk and uh, a lot of ongoing things where the streets get closed down um, and encourage a lot of pedestrian traffic draws a lot of people. Um, and 
I, I really would like to see a way in which we can bring a farmer's market back um, into the downtown area. I think that something's missing, and I can see that because I know a lot of people, especially being that I'm in the sustainability field, uh, I know a lot of folks in the local food movement. And you hear about the Inglewood Farmer's Market, but you rarely hear Aspen Grove, Wednesday, it works for some folks, but having a weekend farmer's market uh, draws a lot of people downtown. My wife and I go to that Pearl Street farmer's market, yeah. drive from Littleton down there, yeah. and, and that place is packed. It uh, is completely The restaurants packed. are busy. It's on a Sunday morning, Yes. and the restaurants are busy, and the shops are busy. That's a very busy location. Did you notice any other development going on, or is there any plans for any additional multifamily the, there's been a lot of uh, scrape-offs in the general area. Um, and they go for, I closed a loan in there, the property was worth $760,000. Yeah, it, it's so becoming that. quite popular and it's a bit disconcerting to some of the people who've lived there. But the you're talking about all, all residential, I believe, is that true? Rather than, I don't think yes, I so all the scrape-offs that I've seen, uh, not on Pearl Street per se, um, but definitely on the surrounding Pennsylvania, um, Washington, on both sides, there is uh, there's a fair amount of, of scrape off activity that's going on. And a lot of younger families moving back into the neighborhood. Because I used to go to the church at 1600 South Pearl 20 years ago, and it was all old people. All old people. Yeah. Was, nobody in that church was under my age at the time, 32 years old. Nobody. So there's um, a lot of young families down there. But it's very active, and, and you look at over there, and, you, and in all honesty, it comes down to what is it that they've got that we don't have except a lot of people going there. Um, and I think that there are ways in which that can be um, addressed. Um, I do want to make some, in light of that, also some general comments, because living on the east side, of here, uh, and you made the comment about 180 degrees versus 360 degrees, and I'd say, well, it's 180 plus, um, because I often, especially when the weather is warmer and, and, and better, try to walk um, here. I definitely will commend the city for finally putting in a pedestrian crosswalk signage um, on the Rio Grande Street. But before that, there wasn't one. Um, so in theory, in order for me to walk here, I either had to go about three times the distance or I had to jaywalk. <laughs> um, the bridge is in many respects definitely the uh, south side of the bridge as you're crossing. That's from uninviting to scary. Um, it's narrow sidewalk. Um, uh, because I often, if I take light rail and I come back, and I will uh, walk on that. And I have taken, because for better or for worse, I've been traveling more. So a lot of times I will come in late at night. I will take um, RTD and light rail from the airport back. And I will come in at night, and I'm taking the suitcase um, on rollers coming up there. And, and I'll tell you, if it's just me in a suitcase and anybody else is coming down on the other side, and if they are on skateboards or bicycles, it gets tight very fast. I have noticed multiple times people uh, from the Center for the Blind taking that road down, and I have to admit that I admire their courage. Um, the um, northern side is wider and more usable, but at the same time, you look at that bridge, and it's purely utilitarian. We have a wonderful entryway into the city coming from Littleton Boulevard. You've got the courthouse, that's fairly prominent. You've got the uh, statues that are on the divide between there, which I think are a little hidden by the vegetation. They're made less prominent by the vegetation than more prominent. And then you cross the bridge, and the bridge says nothing. Um, I honestly think that if that same special marking that was done on the crosswalks in the downtown area was also done just before the bridge, 
mm. uh, from basically the courthouse and the buck center um, to the sheriff's um, building site. And that bridge had some more dis something more distinct about it, an arc. Um, instead of just a fence, maybe put some plywood there and do some do murals, something more on the sidewalk. Th the sense that once you go in there, you're actually not crossing over um, the railroad tracks, but you're entering into something. The occasional banner that hangs into the city, Main Street, it doesn't give you a sense of permanence. I think we can really enhance that entryway that people come in and go, oh, okay, here I am. I'm actually entering into something um, that can tie into a lot of it. Connectivity and signage within downtown. I think there's a lot of things where people go back and forth. And we heard that a lot. But I think that there are a few things, and I'm trying to put some notes together. There's a permaculture uh, principle, and I, I do permaculture design, but one of the principles is the um, greatest effect for the least effort. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's interesting of looking at the downtown area with that principle in mind and try to figure out what are some of the things that would have the greatest effect for the least effort, meaning the least investment. And I think that some signage, some connectivity, we can probably all identify four or five things that will not take much to be able to implement them. Um, yet that could make a big difference, um, especially if two or three things tie in with each other. So I would invite my fellow commissioners and anybody else who's listening to, uh, to maybe think of that. What are some of the things that we could do inexpensively, quickly, with the current regulatory ordinance and, and other situation without going into major things that could um, improve things? Great. I love the idea of the bridge uh, being more of a gateway, and I really hadn't thought about that, but you're absolutely right. Um, there's been a lot of discussion about how bad the sidewalk is on the south side. Charlie uh, Bloss is very aware of that, very concerned, and very concerned that they didn't make a wider sidewalk on the, on the south side when they first did that because it would have been fairly reasonably priced. Now to go, and we've looked at you know, pricing that, it gets very expensive to try and get you know, widen that bridge somehow. But I think there's a lot of recognition that you know, there's a real need to do something there. So. It, there, it gets a little tricky, and part of the problem is it's more of an issue for people from the area who want to walk down to the light rail station because that's the traffic that will be coming to and from the light rail station. And, um, and the bus. I mean, that's it, it's a huge uh, Yeah, route and, and, and ACC and others, and I think that may be something that we can try to get possibly RTD to collaborate. But the north side... I think really has a lot of potential. And the nice thing about the north side is the traffic coming down from Littleton Boulevard and entering downtown tends to slow down. Hmm. Traffic exiting downtown, again, Littleton Boulevard, tends to speed up, which is what makes that sidewalk, and at night, even a hairier experience. Um, but, oh, and the other thing that I want to say, I've noticed that... Um, on, uh, I'm sorry, I have a really bad migraine, and right now my brain isn't fully functioning. But on the, uh, what's the road that goes parallel to ACC on the south side of Church? <laughs> Church. Church. Yes, yeah. thank you. Um, they have signs there um, that they've put in the middle of the crosswalks mm -hmm. that says state law yield to pedestrians. Mm -hmm. um, as a Pedestrian, as much as I can help it, and as a parent of kids, um, things like that, again, are small things. I don't see those in downtown. It would be nice to come in and, again, just reinforce this idea of slow down for pedestrians. Um, and, oh, and the other thing is, since uh, two of my neighbors are on the Fine Arts Commission, and I had the discussion about the bridge with at least one of them, it, it was pointed reminded to me that if we wanted to do art <laughs> on that bridge, it would not be a particularly difficult thing <laughs> to implement. And, and it is, again, a way in which we can bring in what if we brought in the Fine Arts Commission and maybe the Historic Preservation Mission Historic Littleton and said, how could we make that bridge more attractive 
and more keeping with the historical character of the of the downtown that people will be entering. So it becomes this, oh, I'm in some place new. That was one of the things that really struck me about Old Town Arvada in the presentation um, the last time, that you walk in there and you sort of go, oh, I'm here now, as opposed to I'm just zooming by. That north side, or no, I'm sorry, that east side of that bridge should be the most memorable place in Littleton because it's where Alamo, remember the Alamo, mm -hmm. meets Maine. Remember the Maine? <laughs> <laughs> well, in terms of what we're um, going to put in the comp plan and what we heard from the public in the workshops we had, uh, the idea of gateway came through, I think, pretty loud and clear. And I think, you know, at that end, as well as the other end of Main Street, uh, where it meets Santa Fe, that there's sort of a lost opportunity and uh, capturing the attention of people traveling along Santa Fe that, hey, you know, here's downtown Littleton. And um, so I think, um, well, while it's hard to, you know, at the planning commission level uh, specify it's easy to, but we probably shouldn't be specifying, you know, design proposals. I mean, I have a lot of ideas there, but um, we can call them gateways and, and, and make sure that they become important uh, symbols of the entrance into Littleton. Dennis, do you have copies of my pictures of Golden? Uh, I didn't those? get copies. I really apologize, but I will get okay. them for everybody. We can do it next time. Yep. I'll go through I'll the Golden. Yeah. Can we steal the arch from Golden? <laughs> GM yeah, to say olden to well, well, I mean, you can even do it with building massing. I, I think Dick Farley's presentation a couple of weeks ago showed how the intersection of Littleton Boulevard and um, Santa Fe can really transform with buildings on four corners. Yeah, in lots of ways, I think it's much more effective than signage. I think you know, the actual announcing it with use and structure and form really is, probably works better than. Than, than every sign we could possibly put out. We have a lot of signs out now that they don't always work, so yeah. It's good. Uh, other comments? Let me add one yeah. thing, kind of changing the subject a little bit while there's a lull. Um, when I brought my stuff into Dennis, I brought in our schedule that we had had with all the green bars on it. <laughs> it, uh, I believe, was October of last year that we had that ambitious schedule. Um, I guess I'd be interested to know if the rest of the commissioners think it would be helpful to put ourselves on a schedule again uh, with a draft and, you know, when at the other end of the process, whenever that is, think, when we submit it to council. I guess council. from staff perspective, I think it's a great idea. And I think, I think next, this next set is, is the perfect time to do it when we get a draft. Uh, and we kind of say, okay, how much time do we want to spend doing this and when do we want to get to council with the draft? Uh, particularly if we want to try and get there before, you know, as quickly as possible. I, I know they'd love to see something and it would be great for all of us, I think, to have that. So, and get their feedback on where we are. So, Are you in a position where you can get help to do, the, to do that draft part? Um, I am. Uh, if we can figure out who that might be, yeah. Uh, I th I'm not sure that the help would be more... Um, in terms of graphics and some other things rather than writing it. Uh, but I'm open to thoughts in terms of if there's a, the problem is I think anybody coming in fresh, um, not having heard all the discussion is going to have a very difficult time in kind of synthesizing the discussion we've had and putting it into text. Um, whereas I think if I at least take a first shot at it and you guys can, 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 can you know, edit and change and get rid of stuff and add stuff, I think that gives us a better shot. And I'm actually fairly close to having that ready. So um, I, I think we'll be okay. But but if you think there are additional things we need to be doing in terms of, you know, doing the text or doing graphics that help explain it, uh, we're definitely in a position to do that. So We're definitely going to need some graphics yes. because it's a very complicated... It is, yeah, absolutely. So I, I've talked to Dick Farley about doing some of that again, and I think it's a great way to go because he does a great job of kind of synthesizing <laughs> ideas on kind of small scale in terms of here's what we're really talking about. So... I agree with Norm. I think we really need to focus on developing a schedule and also a process on how we're going to approach actually finishing it up. So, Good. Yeah, and I, I think absolutely in terms of what we want to do as a whole, do we want to break into smaller groups that look at different chapters? You know, so th think about that in terms of what you think is most effective, what is most timely in terms of you know, how we actually get through this. 
My big question to you is, is it going to be three feet of documentation or it's going to be rather slim, your draft? It's probably longer than it should be at this point, just because I would like to have something real succinct and to, you know, but I think I'm really torn in terms of trying to cover as many, you know, because we've had so many good ideas and so many discussions, it's probably longer than, it, than it, we may want it to be. I, and I, that's a, a question, I think, for Commission, too, in terms of, you know, what do you want this thing to look like? So do you want it to be succinct, or do you want it something that actually is more inclusive? So. I guess I would have to wait until you get gave us a draft. Okay, good. Yeah, that's kind of what my thought is, too, so let's see. But at this point, I would agree with, I think, the way that you're going. I would rather that the draft has more okay. rather than less because it's easier, especially because there's been a, kind of some interruptions and, and fits and starts. It's easier to go, do we really need this mm -hmm. versus going, you know, a week after the thing was approved by city council, go, we forgot that. Right. <laughs> you know? well, Ho hopefully not. I think there's enough of us. But, anyway. but again, it's, it's just because we've heard so many you know, good ideas in the last year. Uh, it's going to be really tough to make sure we cover everything. So it's, it's going to be trying to get that concept and make sure we at least got the heart of what we've heard. I think. So. We could also have another document that has those suggestions for city council um, saying that we didn't specifically want to include them into the comp plan because of these reasons. Mm -hmm. You know, and I think that's also very useful to get those good ideas forward. Yeah, and we certainly have you know, a basis for that with all the, the inter you know, the, the summary of the interviews we've had, the summary from the different meetings we've had. Um, so all that, I think, is, is, is good background material that we might want to include, as you said, in a separate document or an appendix or something. Yeah, so. Another question. Uh, Citizens Planning Academy, there was an ad hoc committee and I guess I'm unclear, even though I don't think I've missed any meetings, as to whatever happened with what that. What happened to it is the City Council, at one of the first study session for the budget, voted to give staff um, authority to go ahead and write an RFP for that and then bring it back to them. So I've been going through different evolution in terms of what that really looks like at this point. Um, and that was you know, how much we do in-house, how much do we actually farm out to, you know, to somebody else to do. And it seems to me like it's a great opportunity to do some other things we want to do in terms of you know, really getting a good analysis of our process and, and a good you know, description of what that is. And so I'm really kind of leaning towards at least initially taking that as a RP for somebody to do that as part of their you know, data analysis for you know, what, what they're going to be doing for the, for the uh, for the academy, so that's kind of where I'm heading with it. But I'm hoping to get that done fairly quickly and back to council. So they did authorize that to go forward. So, so. One thing that I want us to also start thinking of, and it might seem a little premature, but I, I think we'll be surprised with how uh, not premature it is. It's next stage, hmm. it, it, so that we don't have a situation where we've um, closed says okay we submitted the plan to the city council and, and I think if it is if we start looking at a timeline and a schedule I think they'll be really useful to add to it because there is this period where we've done our work we had our public hearing we have our recommendations it's gone over to city council now city council's got to go through its first reading second reading and, and public hearing, that process takes a, um, a while. That's a bit of a law. That's the time, I think, for us to, to regroup and say, lessons learned. And maybe if we can put that on the schedule Good. of, Good. and in particular, what I'd like to see is a time in which we um, do an evaluation of this first process of how did things work because we decided to do the downtown comp plan um, first for a variety of reasons, um, only one of which was just the urgency that the area required. Um, another one was that it provided a pretty good um, potential template for the rest of the city because almost all components that at some point or another would be in different areas of the city can be found um, downtown. So an explicit way of looking at it and an outreach. And an idea that I want to just throw out, not necessarily discuss right now because I think it's premature to discuss it, but we started out outreach with a survey first and then we went into um, 
public uh, meetings and outreach meetings. And I'd like us to consider the possibility of reversing the order of those uh, as we're going into specific neighborhoods. And the reason for it is that, um, and I was reminded that at a workshop that I went to for something unrelated uh, to here, a more professional workshop, that surveys are often ineffective. Uh, and one of the reasons are is because the questions tend to limit themselves. And open meeting or some neighborhood meetings can actually do a pretty good job of determining what questions one shall put in the survey. And I think we, we discovered that a little bit. Would the survey be the same had we done it after um, the Hudson Gardens meeting and, and all the meetings that we had um, in here? And especially if we're going into residential neighborhoods where we may have more interest and less clear idea of what we do and slightly more unified voices. Downtown is very complex. Um, again, just as an idea that the outreach can be um, fact-finding as much as us telling them what we found. Other thoughts? I will get that out to you on the 22nd. We meet again on the 26th. Um, so you'll have a draft at that point, and we'll start talking schedule at that point, too, in terms of where we want to go and, and how we want to present this. And I think you're right in terms of process. How do we want to, uh, do we want to take this back out again to the neighborhood before we go to city council um, and get their buy-off? What, 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 what are you comfortable with in terms of process so, okay. and timing? I thought we were going we, to have a public yeah. hearing on. We have a public hearing, but do you have a public meeting before you have a public hearing to kind of go out and have a more informal discussion? Bottom line is, you know, mm -hmm. you're going to give them time to read it. Right, no matter what. Regardless. Right. My, my thought always is with a public hearing, it's a more if finished you go, product. So. But if, you, but if you go into a public meeting and not a public mm -hmm. hearing, mm -hmm. you know, the bottom line is anybody and everybody, I mean, you're going to have a selected group of people right. in front of you that may either agree or disagree, but it's not a, it's not a public hearing, so you can't really make any decision based upon their input. Good point. And I don't think okay. they understand that. Okay. So okay. I'm not so Good point. You know, thrilled about talking about it mm -hmm. and then finding out that, you know, I gotta vote on it later on mm -hmm. and I'm getting swayed one way or another. Good. Okay. Great. Good point. Uh, I would agree with that. I think that unless we feel that we need um, any significant more public input before we can finalize the draft. And I think to some extent that can become apparent after our next meeting, um, that then we do a public hearing. What I'd like to see is spend some time in an outreach effort um, before the public hearing of, of providing more than adequate, not just what's legally adequate, but what is realistically adequate in giving people's busy lives um, notice for people to read, review, and come in with comments. And I also would like us to figure out um, different mechanisms that we also uh, publicize and make readily available for folks who um, can't. I mean, there are some people who may work every Monday evening, and therefore it's not possible for them to attend a public hearing, but they may have things to say. Um, so that we create a mechanism through which people have time to send comments to us that so they can be introduced into the public hearing as part of the process um, by sending a letter or an email or, or anything else. Uh, how do we maximize input uh, and participation into the, into the public hearing. So for the next meeting, are we saying that we definitely want to discuss the schedule and then discuss the process and address this very specific topics in the comp plan? And are we actually reviewing the plan in were, the meeting? Or I would what like was you to intention? review the plan at the meeting. You'll have it uh, on, the, on the Wednesday before. And so it's a draft. It won't have the graphics in it, but it'll have the text. It'll have the organization and have the general concepts in it. So I would really like to get into that meet at this point. And then I think the discussion in terms of process follows that in my mind. I think we kind of look at it, see what it is, and say, okay, where do we go? how do we get this done? Does that make sense? Okay. 
How about if we take that schedule from a year ago and maybe everybody puts an X as to where are we now on that, not time-wise, we're way past it, but where in the process. And then also you could interject if there's another step in the process or if you want to rearrange a public meeting before a public hearing or something like that, and then maybe we can distill the schedule to move forward, and Dennis doesn't have to do the whole thing, <laughs> and then have us poke holes in it, almost like our, what should the area of consideration be, and then we try to resolve our differences. My concern with just reviewing the comp plan without very specific action items is that we'll just get bogged down in all these different details and we won't be focusing on, you know, are, do we have the right topics in the comp plan? I mean, in the, you know, we'll get bogged down with the text itself. Okay. So mm -hmm. you want to have very specific questions we go through as, and we ask ourselves as we're reviewing the plan, the draft plan. So are these the right topics? Are they? Are we covering it adequately? Are we uh, are we giving clear enough direction? Mm -hmm. Are we setting priorities you know, clearly enough? That type of thing. So okay. Yeah, and there's some questions too that we need to answer as a planning commission that are going to take some time for us to go through and address. On any and all of those sections, whatever they are that you're going to come up with, mm -hmm. I'm looking for goals, policies, and to use what Linda used as action items. Mm -hmm. Yes. Before we see it. Good. So that we can either agree, disagree, or change. Yes. Yep. Good. Move to adjourn. I'll second. second. We still have two minutes. <laughs> is, is, is that an amendment? <laughs> Great. Thank you. Boy, that was unanimous. Yeah, I don't know. <laughs>